We're gonna build a fence. We're gonna build a wall. Heard that a lot over the last few years, haven't we? It's been all the rage in politics. It's been the hot button issue about immigration and border control and all the political things that go along with it. Fences, fences, walls, and more fences. The irony for me is that as I observe this, I often see that some of the most vocal voices in this argument are people who themselves live or work in places with very high walls and fences and locked doors and security all around them. It's interesting, for, for who we are as Christians, we, we, we want to be trusting, loving people. We want to put the best construction on everything. That's our nature. That's our life. We want to believe that everyone's God-fearing and loving and has a respect for life and respect for their fellow human being. But the reality is that that's not always the world we live in. And that there is a need for walls and for fences and for locked doors and security systems and all those things around us because sin and evil and brokenness do exist for us in the world. And so it's a challenge. It's a struggle. And it fuels a lot of the emotion behind the debates and the arguments and the discussions that surround us. As you know, this past Tuesday, a bunch of us were returned from the Holy Land. It was an incredible trip. And we were very safe the whole time. Never once did we at all feel as though our lives were in danger or there was any sort of problem that surrounded us. It was incredible. And I, I'm sure that you're going to hear me a lot over the next year or so talk a lot about various aspects of the trip because I have just found that it is going to be an incredible blessing to my preaching and teaching. And you, unfortunately, are going to have to suffer through it and hear it over and over again probably to your sick of it. But one of the things that we had the pleasure of observing and seeing is we got during those... Uh, those days that we were there to go visit a bunch of different ancient towns and villages and cities. And as we went to, some of them were just Roman, some of them were biblical, whatever they were. As we get to the city, one thing that we noticed that was consistent with all of them is that they were all defined by a wall or two walls. A wall with inside a wall. Because that was the reality of how they protected themselves and defined their boundaries and, and kept their people safe inside. And so the context of walls and fences was something that was very well known to the people to whom Jesus was speaking in our gospel lesson today. When he says, I am the gate through which the righteous, through which the sheep enter, those people back then had a very clear visual understanding of what he was talking about. Because in each of these places that we went where we saw the walls, there was just one or two or maybe three gates through which people could enter. Otherwise, the walls were designed to keep people in and keep other people out. And so Jesus uses this as an opportunity to talk about the struggles of sin and grace and then the blessings that he brings to his people. Now, I know we all desire to live in a world where there is nothing but peace on earth and goodwill to all men, where we can all get along, where we can all share and care for one another. But as we've seen throughout history, because as we looked at these various places that we visited and looked at the walls, we could see pile upon pile of different times during the course of the last two or three thousand years where the walls were broken down and another group of people came in and took over the city. And then another group came in and took over the city and so on and so forth throughout the history that had passed by. So as much as we want everyone to get along and love one another, that's not the reality that surrounds us in history nor in the world today. There are still many places in the world where walls and fences divide and put up boundaries to people. In particular, one of the things that we were front row witnesses to during our trip that had nothing to do with any of the Bible or the spiritual stuff is that we had a front row seat to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And we had an opportunity to talk to a lot of different people and observe a lot of different things. And unfortunately, what I can say to you is that after spending nine days in this environment and having these conversations, I have no better understanding or no clue to how this whole thing can be fixed. What I can tell you is that during our time in the Holy Land, we traveled in and out of two different nations, a nation inside of a nation, Palestine inside of Israel. 
And sometimes we had to go through border control and checkpoints. Sometimes we entered into areas that had big red signs that said, this is a Palestinian area, Israeli citizens are not welcome and should not enter here. It's amazing, hard to imagine. But the irony was that as we got to talk to regular people, lay people, people not in control, not in the government, whether they were Israeli or Palestinian, they had a mutual love and respect for each other. They actually understood that they needed each other to exist. They needed each other for commerce, for their economy, for their, for their well-being and, and their lives together. As a matter of fact, we went into an area in Palestine. We had lunch at a, at a Palestinian restaurant. It was beautiful. And I thought to myself, uh, Palestinians only come here? And I asked the guide and I asked the, uh, the people that were there. And they said, oh, no, 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 Israelis come in all the time. And they come to this restaurant. We love to have them. They love to come here. That's the only way that the restaurant can exist. So really, a lot of the tensions that exist and the divisions that are there that we see on in the news are really a result of government and politics and people that aren't down on the ground with the regular people doing the regular things. But the thing we take away from it is there in this most holy land, the place that changed the world as we know it, the place that gave birth to the hope that we live for each and every day, is a place divided, where walls and fences exist because sin and evil is real. That's what Jesus was getting at. That's why this gospel lesson for this, this Good Shepherd Sunday is so important and powerful for us. And Jesus takes two images that are very familiar to the people of the Holy Land and combines them together to make some powerful points. First, by saying, I am the gate, they understood walls, they understood gates, and then by saying, I am the good shepherd who leads people out of the pasture into the safety of the pen. What Jesus was doing on his way to the cross was recognizing once again that sin and evil and the brokenness that tears down and brings pain into our lives is indeed very real. And that's the reason why he was giving himself over to death to rise again for us and give us that hope. And so what he's saying to those listeners back then and to us today is that in the midst of a world filled with sin and evil and death, I am the one to lead you to protection. Listen to my voice. Follow me. Trust in me. New Zealand is another country that's surrounded by sheep and shepherds. And a New Zealander was once asked to describe what would happen to a sheep that doesn't have a shepherd. And he said, well, at first they'd probably be all right for a little while. They'd be able to find their own food in certain pastures and, and valleys. But eventually they'd start going off in different directions that probably weren't so safe for them. They would all of a sudden become prey to predators. But the real danger over the course of time for those sheep that didn't have a shepherd was that they might become what is called cast. See, as the wool grows on their bodies, it grows so much over the course of time that they end up becoming top-heavy. And at some point, they become so top-heavy, if they're not sheared, they fall over. And once they fall over, they can't get back up on their own. So they become cast, they become a victim to prey, they come and eat off of them very easily, but if they're down too long and they don't get eaten by some other animal, what happens is their organs shift inside. And once their organs shift, if somebody does eventually come and pick them up again, it's probably too late because their organs won't shift back to where they were in the first place and it'll eventually lead them to their death. So the role of the shepherd is very important to pick them up, to protect them, to shear them, that they're not wobbling and falling over all over the place. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says to us. So as I look at the world, I look at the leaders of the world, I look at the governments that surround us, I honestly don't have a lot of hope that we're ever going to find a solution to these border struggles and conflicts, to the problem between Palestine and Israel. I, I, I think it's a, a situation that might never go away because sin is a reality that never goes away. 
And that's exactly why Jesus calls us to you. As the shepherd and the keeper of the gate to lead us to safe pastures. As the one who calls us by name. As the one who speaks his voice to us as we gather here as often as possible in his word and sacraments. So that in this world of division, in this world of brokenness, in this world filled with sin and evil, we can find the safety, the safety of the pasture that our Lord gives to us and our Lord leads us to. Back in the late 80s when there was the Palestinian uprising in Israel, there was a time when the Israeli soldiers were going around and as a result of the uprisings, they were punishing the Palestinian citizens by taking away all their livestock. They brought all their livestock to one big pen that was guarded by Israeli soldiers on all sides. But there was this one woman who came one day to the commander of, of the guard and outside of the pen and she begged of the man. She said, look, this is my only way of living. My husband is dead and these animals are the only thing that feed me. And the commander just looked at her and kind of laughed and he said, there are thousands of sheep that we've confiscated that are in this pen. How do you possibly think you're going to be able to find your sheep? And she said, please, sir, please, I need them to live. If I can find my sheep, Will you allow me to take them? And he laughed, thinking it would never happen, saying, sure, okay, you can do that. So the woman got her son, and her son came along with her, and her son started to play on a reed flute, the same tune, over and over again. And one by one, heads would pop up out of the flock, out of the many, many sheep that are all around, and then they started to follow the boy and his mom and the sound until... 25 sheep later, they were walking their way out of the pen in front of the guard, just smiling and laughing as the sheep came. What did Jesus say to us? When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. In that song we all love. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Here in this place, around these gifts of Jesus' death and resurrection, we get a peek over the fence, a peek to the place eternal where there will be no more division, no more brokenness, no more pain. 